All right. All right, so um, can we get left on the white balance? That is good. Um, you see anybody have any white that I can stay focused on? Yeah. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Are you recording? And now I am. All right. Um, so today we're here with uh, Jesse and Jason from Gravitas Records, and uh, they're going to talk to us a little bit about the music. And uh, Jesse has his presentation, and then Jason will give his. Uh, both of these people um, are really well known uh, nationally in terms of their work. They both uh, have performed with the biggest acts in the world. Um, Jesse uh, mainly does music production. Uh, Jason does music production and visuals. Uh, but Jesse also does producing, and so he'll also work with artists to help him um, like take their work to the next level. So um, without further ado, here's uh, Jesse. Guys. Creativity in business, and so I don't want to do the same talk again. So I, I created this one for you guys, but we'll probably go back to some of the stuff I talked about last year and tie some things in. Um, so, something that I'm really focused on in my life right now I'm 32, married, trying to really take my career to the next level. And, um, you know, it's like every day I wake up, what do I want to accomplish in my life? What is what do I want to create? What's the world that I want to create? And so with that, you know, some things that I've been studying and researching is you know, making the most of my time and, and just some basic tricks and tips for you know, really creating the life I want to live and uh, I want to share that with you guys and I hope that's uh, interesting for you. So like uh, Joey introduced me pretty well. Um, Jesse Breda, I run Gravitas Recordings, a uh, music label based out of Austin, Texas. Um, done a lot of different things in my life. Entrepreneur, run a label. Um, I run out DJ gear around Texas. Um, I DJ quite a bit. I'm a producer of music with DJ with Jason. I do DJing, which is basically like DJing with video. Um, I've promoted and put on shows. I've been a stage manager. I've done sound engineering. Um, and then. In 1998, I went to UT for computer science, so I've done web programming, uh, computer programming, graphic design, been a blogger, and a photographer. So the only reason I say that is it kind of will tie into this whole talk and some of the approaches that I've taken to do some of these things. So you guys are going to school, I figure that's important for you. What, what are the thing that you want to do is the craft, the creative, Industry that you want to own and, and be involved with. So, uh, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of people doing a lot of things in the world, and I think you know, we all set goals for ourselves. We all kind of put ourselves out there to say, you know, what is it I want to do? And really, for me, the difference between success and failure is really just the, the idea that you try and really get out there and do it. So. I don't know if you guys can read this quote. This is from Michael Jordan. It says, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game winning shot and miss. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. So I think you know that tells a story of when you're out there and you're doing it, you're going to fail. You're going to have hard times. You're going to hit you know, roadblocks. But to keep going and really put yourself out there is what, in my mind, is success. So there's this uh, study called the Zergernik effect, and basically is as soon as you start something, you know, put pen to paper, you're basically compelled to finish it. Like there's something in your mind, in your brain, that will keep reminding you that you want to finish it. So you know, I have this with music where I'll start a project and I won't finish it. <clears throat> One minute. But I know it's there, and it's like it kind of pops up in my head. And it's like you know, finished me. So I think that's, that's something you can use to your advantage. 
of if you really want to get involved with something, just get started. Just do that first thing, whatever it is. Open up the program and just deal around with it. Try to make a movie. Try to make a song. Just getting started is is so much of, of the battle. Um, and with that, with that so, but um, when you once you get past that first roadblock of getting started with something, then it's like, okay, how are you going to make efficient use of your time? How are you going to get the most out of that, that time spent doing it? And what they what studies show is that deliberate practice is really how you can take something and get proficient with it quickly. Rather than, like, let's say it's basketball, rather than just going out there and shooting around and just kind of throwing up the ball, actually sitting down and like, I want to practice my free throw, and like, focusing on your form, thinking about what makes a good free throw, putting yourself in the game, kind of being really deliberate and focused about what you're doing and what you want to do. For instance, like, when I, when I have a show coming up and I'm going to go DJ, I basically visualize myself in that night and what I want it to go like. And when I program the songs or the set, I think about what I want that to be like. So that's kind of that deliberate focus, you know, like Zen approach to, to making something happen. A little Star Wars reference for you. So, <laughs> so the idea of focused practice and the, the deliberate practice, you know, you can kind of expand on that, get a little more detail. And there's this I guess they kind of study or these patterns they found in humans. I'm not actually really totally sure how you say it, the ultra ultradian rhythms. And that's basically in people, just like everything in nature and life, you have these cycles, you know, the seasons, flowers grow, flowers die, the waves, whatever. People have that. You have these rhythms inside yourselves too, just like your circadian rhythms of how you go to sleep and how you wake up. And you can take advantage of those rhythms and really make the most out of your day. So rather than fighting and struggling when you get tired, when you get bored with something, take a break and use that to your advantage, like focused rest, and then when you go back and you start to practice again, you're actually going to get the most bang for your buck. Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions? So that, for example, what they found is that somewhere between 90 and 120 minutes of practice, really focused, you know, whatever you're studying or editing or working on a track, whatever you want to do, allot yourself that much time, and then as you start to burn out and get fatigued, take a break. Take a 20-minute break, go walk outside, go have a banana, go do something healthy, go stretch, whatever it is you like to do. Don't go, don't go chase Facebook or go watch YouTube. Those, that's not actually decompression, actually making your brain work really hard when you do that way. Chill, relax, and then go do your thing again, and, and it'll 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 really help you. So, does that make sense? Cool. Another little cool thing here. This is all I know, crazy names and stuff, but the bond restore effect, and I just think this is interesting. So that 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 time that we were seeing of like that 120 minutes. Here's here the graph is just 100 minutes but with no break and and all this extra stuff. You would have a like comprehension rate that would look like like a really small like a dip line so about way through you're just like feeding yourself information and you're practicing and you're not really getting that much out of it but with a break you get a, a dip like that of a higher you and so you get more comprehension more practice and then so this cool thing that I that I just read is if you put something like fun or interesting or like a bright color, whatever it is you're studying, or like a really fun song that you like to practice, if you sandwich that in the middle of your practice session, it'll like pique your interest again, it'll wake you up, it'll get you excited again, and get you back to like rolling with, you, with your practice session. So. so this kind of throws back to the last talk we gave. I don't know if you're familiar with Tracy, but you know, it's kind of a blur. Um, there's this guy Malcolm Gladwell, and he talks about the 10,000 hour rule. And his basic idea is that in order to become a master at something, you have to do like you have to practice it for 10,000 hours. And once you've done that, you should be pretty amazing. You should have mastered this. But I think that's to say that you're probably in the top five or top one percent of whatever you're trying to do in the world. And 
Now, I don't think that we all have to set our goals to be that. I think what I'm talking about and going back to you know, all the different things I've done in my life is I like to have a cursory, pretty you know, basic knowledge of things and go play in that sandbox, learn about photography, and then go set that down, and then go do web programming, set that down, go do DJ, and go do... And for me, that's a lot of fun. Like I get to do a lot of different stuff and meet a lot of different people. So for me, I'm kind of saying we don't have to all aspire to be the best in the world for something. You can take a different approach and set your goal, and and inside that, you know, you don't have to think, oh, I'm gonna have to dedicate ten years of my life to doing this thing. So, and the reason I say that. Is, is a really cool book, really cool guy. His name is Timothy Ferris. He wrote the Four Hour Work Week, Four Hour Body, and just recently the Four Hour Chef. Four Hour Chef is really cool. It's he's like breaking um, the mold of what it means to be a publisher, be a writer. He's basically selling all of his books online and just kind of kicking everybody's butt right now. His idea is this idea of meta learning. And this is kind of his approach and his new way of saying it, but it's something that I've kind of been doing. I was like, oh, cool. Somebody, you know, put this in, in words for me. And don't, you don't have to read all this, but the basic idea is that he deconstructs whatever it is he wants to do. He takes, like, the most important 20% of the thing that you, you do, and he studies that as much as possible. So, like, in language, if you know... The basics of a language you can get by. That's the basic principle. So you want to learn like the basics of something, and then if you see the most important stuff and you see it in the right the right way, you can really rapidly acquire anything. So his example, he learned Japanese in six months. I don't know if you guys have ever tried to read Japanese, but <laughs> <laughs> for an American, that's like he came back and he was able to outread and outwrite people that were born in Japan who lived. By, by his method of meta learning, is what he called it. So, again, that's, that's pretty dense. I'm not going to read all that. Um, so, for me, so that's kind of like how do you learn, how do you approach something, how do you break something down into small, small, smaller parts and kind of assimilate it and learn it. And then for me, it's like, well, what do you, why do you want to do all that? What's the purpose of it? So, for me, it's like, okay, setting your goals of where do you want to go in your life, what do you want to achieve is something I think is really important for people because if you don't do that, then as you go through life, you might just like take a right turn or take a left turn for whatever thing seems interesting at the time. But And that may be good. It may work out well. But I think if you have a goal and you have a vision and you say the thing you want to do in your life, that will start to happen naturally just by virtue of you saying that that's what you want to do. Um, so for me, I set goals for a year, and then I try to set them once a month, so I can say, okay, this month I'm going to try and tackle this thing. And usually, the smaller monthly goals tie into my bigger yearly goals, and then I do daily and weekly of saying, okay, how am I going to get through those things? So again, it's just taking a big thing, big idea, breaking down to smaller pieces and going after it. The way I do that is by making a plan and really writing it down. What is that big thing I want to do? So for this year, one of the, one of my big goals is to take the music catalog that we have with our record label, which is now like our twenty eighth official release. Um, take that and start to license it to movies, commercials, video games, whatever. Put it on YouTube, make money like that. So, you know. There's kind of a gold rush right now on electronic music. I don't know if you guys are into that stuff or not, but it's, you know, all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> back in my day, when I was a startup, it was very underground, and now you have people that are, you know, you're hearing like a dubstep on Mazda commercials and stuff like that. It's like, I don't know. I think that's, that's interesting and, and, and exciting, and it's something that I, I always thought was pop, like, in my career. So. Um, one thing with that is, I think it's easy to say, like, like, you want to be an actor, I want to be a director. That's a really, and that may be, you know, what you want to do, but I would say be more specific and make it measurable. Like, so for me, like, the goal is not just to license our music to television and films, but I want to license a song to a film, and I have a number, a dollar number that I want to make. So it's like, just help me to, to zoom. Okay, 
you got to make the most of it. How, how do you do that? For me, I have, a, I have a morning routine that helps me like really get started, like just come out of bed and actually do something um, to really fire myself. So I've been trying to get up earlier. I don't know if any of you guys like sleeping. I do. <laughs> uh, first thing I do is I drink a big glass of water. When you're sleeping, you dehydrate. I don't know if you guys know that, but it's 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 uh, you know and that really affects your brain. That affects your metabolism. Those things. So just having a big glass in the morning actually really like gets your body moving. You know, help you urinate, all things like that. Just good stuff to get going. Um, stretching and breathing, same like you're deoxygenated when you um, when you sleep. You, most people don't breathe that deeply when they're sleeping, so their their blood is not very full of oxygen. You need oxygen in your brain, I think. So focused breathing, thinking, like you know, actually focusing on your breath and have a big thing. For me, I kind of tie that into meditation. I don't know if any of you guys are into that, but for me, my meditation is not some big, long, arduous thing. It's really just five minutes of just kind of focusing myself, centering myself. Like sometimes you'll have to wake up and feel like the day got off to a bad start. Like I can kind of bring myself in and then focus on what is this I really want to do today, and uh, and then have a good food. You know, have good food. Have something that's that's healthy, that's good for your brain. Um, protein, like. Um, Having like two or three eggs in the morning is, a, is getting all your protein as early as you can. It really helps you get going. This nourishment for your brain. If you're really thinking and working hard, you, you really need that. So helps me. Give it a shot. Uh, this is called MITS, most important thing. So let's say if I asked you to make a list of all the things you wanted to do today, it just kind of comes stream of consciousness. Like you just write it out. Well, I would ask you to organize that and put it on the list of like what are the actual top three things you want to get done today, and really just focus on those things. Other stuff like you know, a month from now you would look back and you wouldn't remember the really trivial stuff. So it's kind of a lesson there. Of like, does it actually matter? You know, some of it does. Like, yeah, you got to take your stuff to the laundry or you know, dry cleaners, whatever. But Actually, focusing on the things that are most important to you, accomplishing the goals that you set for yourself, first thing in the morning. That way, you don't let the day get out from under you. Like uh, again, what is it to be proactive versus reactive? Like say, the first thing you do when you get up after you've done a little routine or whatever is check check email, and then you kind of get hit with something that's like somebody telling you what you they think that, that you need to do with you. You just kind of go off. And it's, again, having your plan, having your focus, it's not going off on that road. Yeah, taking that weird turn where you know it's not going to be what you want to do today. So going after things that's most important to you first thing in the morning, I think, is is something that it sounds, oh yeah, of course, but actually putting it into practice and doing it, I think, can really make a big difference. So that ties into what I call an existence system. That's basically like how do you manage your life when we all are very busy, we all get inundated with things to do that we want to do, you know, even just your social life or making time for your boyfriend or your girlfriend, um, even scheduling your your time for relaxation. From seven to nine, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to play video games or, you know, I'm going to go for a walk. So for me, I use this app. This is a really cool app. If you guys have iPhones or Android smartphones. It's called Wonderlist, and I just look and it helps you make lists. Um, you can say like you know laundry or you know school, basic big categories, and then within that you can put all your to dos that you need for that. And then you can say I need to do it on this date, and then I want you to remind me through email or you pop up on your phone. Things are really cool. I mean, if you have a lot of stuff you need to do, remind you to study whatever. Um, I love it. Is it free? Yeah, totally, totally free. Um, for me, even like it was today, I just like to write stuff down too because I really like to scratch it off. It's just like fun. It's like nailed it, bam, done. So I don't know. <laughs> and then for me, like any any appointments or, or things that I'm doing, so they, like my wife and I we share a calendar so she can see. Oh, we've got this gig here. You're going to San Antonio on Monday. You're going to be out of town this week. Like I don't know. It's an easy way to do it. And then I don't know how many people I've had 
tell me they fight with their significant other because of that. Oh, you didn't tell me, you know, you had that or you had that on the calendar to go to dinner or whatever and you forgot. Like, guys, listen to me, I'm telling you. So. <laughs> Just share the calendar. <laughs> share the calendar. The other thing is, like, if you're really busy, you're going to say you're studying, you want to make, you want to make a song, whatever, something, something that you really want to do, turn off your internet if you don't need it. Turn off your phone if you don't need it. Don't multitask. Don't want to have a million things going on. Don't have the TV on. Don't have the radio. Just focus. Um, I know it sounds trivial. But I think I think we are all guilty of it. I know I am. So I'm trying to. Something that's interesting about that is that, like back ten years ago, when you you were doing this and I was been doing this, um, the equipment was so expensive and so like cumbersome that you wouldn't have the internet on <laughs> while you were using it because you didn't want it to crash. That's you didn't want to have these problems. <laughs> and so it was literally like within the workflow that you didn't work, you didn't go online while you were using the computer to do Pro Tools audio editing. And what's so crazy to me is that you all can just be on Firefox or Safari and also recording a voiceover at the same time. <laughs> and it, it really like d does affect how well you're recording, not like the, like, like digitally, but like, because of this, the fact that you're not like putting your full attention in. Yeah. But it also, like maybe it adds something else. I don't know. Like, they've, they've, that's that's what's really interesting. They've proven that multitasking yeah. is it's worse than being drunk. And it lowers your IQ like dramatically, and they've shown it in workers, and it's really, I mean, there's something there. So, um, I don't know, I, that, but that's very yeah. true. I mean, the computers have come a long way, so. This is just a great quote from Steve Jobs. I think he, you know, obviously accomplished a lot. He changed the world, and I'm over here doing like four Apple products at the same time, so. Almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. For me, it's just, I don't know, again, it comes back to focusing, cutting out the stuff that you don't need, and, and just going at what you really need and want to do with your life, and, and letting the other stuff fall by the wayside so that you can actually and my wife said she was just at South by Southwest. She was like, "You don't have any cat pictures in your slides, so here's a cat picture." <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, you guys, if you have any questions, I'd love to connect. Like, I really, I take this stuff seriously. It's really fun to share what I've done with you guys. And um, you know, we started Gravitas basically as a creative collective. Um, and there's room for everything. We have people that do video editing, photography, DJing, DJing. You know, people that uh, want to design clothes. So it's it's everything. It's not just music. So I don't know. Hit me up if you want, Jason. Do you guys have any questions? Do you have a card? I do. If you want. Okay. Yeah, actually, I do have some presents for you too. So let's see. We're we gonna do that. We'll do that. Who, uh, Jason, you want to start getting set up? Yeah. You ask me. Any questions? So, so what y'all saying? That is funny because part of the people in here are my new favorite media in the class. I just lectured them about how they need to like, start working harder and get into like putting like hours and hours and hours and hours of work into their project. And so, um, Hopefully, uh, Jesse gave you some ideas on how to manage your time in order to pull off those 10,000 hours in the next month. Yeah. <laughs> next month, if you mathematically right. figure that out, uh, so that you can pull off your projects. But I, I think you made a really valid point um, that, you know, it's one thing to say, you know, to be in communication arts or to be working in any field like this is Viv here that uh, does WordPress hosting. Um, Anybody that, that is highly motivated and wants to do something, it, it's one thing to say you want to do that. It's another thing to do it every day. Um, well, like when he's talking about watching TV, like I haven't sat down and watched TV in, in like I don't know how long. I haven't even played video games in probably at least a month. Um, so you know, it's kind of one of those things where like it, it's real cheesy when they say be about it. I, I think that that's a really cheesy saying. 
but it's something that I kind of kind of understand that when you have when you have that kind of competition around you and that kind of friendship around you that people are being about it all the time, it does tend to create a space where people can transcend uh, a creative limit that is normally meaning that a lot of times um, you're limited by the people that are around you and you're limited by the effort that they're putting into their own work around you. So by you working harder, the people around you tend to also work harder. And by you thinking creatively and sharing those creative ideas, you tend to trans as a group tend to start transcending uh, the sum of the parts. You start making greater and greater ideas. That was like a act lab manifesto right there. Yeah. Because that's that's exactly how it was. I mean when I when I was doing act lab with Joey and them, um, I was finding myself staying up to like four in the morning, hanging out, like helping other people with their projects. Like we were shooting Ashley's project in that, in that studio. Well, why don't you know what Ashley does? What does Ashley do now? I don't know if you've ever heard of Cartoon Network or <laughs> Robot Chicken or anything like that. But uh, yeah, she has the privilege to animate with those guys now after studying with this guy. Um, so cool yeah, he knows where to get you. Um, and it's one of those things where she was like a very playful person that just wanted to be in animation. And she's like, I I'm really, I really like stop motion animation. That's what I'm going to do with my life. So she went out to love and like, I mean, she was out, but she played. She had fun. She did a lot of other stuff too. But when she was doing her stop motion, like that's what she did, and she didn't leave anything on the table. I know when I was talking to all about creativity is that a lot of times when you're in school, you're like, well, this is good enough, you know, I just need to get a grade. And, I'll, you know, that's that kind of attitude, when you're paying thousands of dollars yeah. to be here, and you're paying, um, and other people are getting similar educations online for free by just going on YouTube and watching the okay? And, and are putting more effort into it than you are, and they're not getting a grade. They're your competition when you get out. And they might not even have a degree and they can annihilate you because they've taken their craft that seriously. They want it that bad. Is that you see what I'm saying? So like you not only have to have a degree, you have to have that drive. And that's kind of what I'm referring to when I talk about that. But uh, on the other hand, a lot of y'all are all transcending that too at the same time. Let me introduce Jason real quick. So Jason said we went to this thing called the Act Lab together. I think all of y'all have heard me talk about the Act Lab before. But for those of y'all that haven't, I will briefly mention it. So Act Lab is a uh, program that no longer exists at UT Austin that Jason and I were part of. Uh, it was founded by Sandy Stone, who was my um, mentor. And uh, she ran the program in 2003. She uh, was about to give up on the program. They were trying to get rid of her and telling her to leave. And uh, Brandon and I, uh, who Brandon's not here, but all, most of y'all have met Brandon, uh, were like, no, we will save the Act Lab. And so for the next 10 years, like Brandon and I, working with Sandy, and we were just TAs. Like, we weren't professors or anything. We just, like, literally single handedly took over the RTF program and took the program from just being, like, a program that was about to fall off into, like, this crazy 120% like, collective where people were working 24-7 to just make crazy projects. And like we said, people have, they, they, we have people all over the world that are doing all kinds of projects. I was uh, with John the other day in Austin, uh, show work with back there recording, and um, somebody was like, you're part of the Act Lab, that's like some like New York movement that people just never got to see, and I was like. Is that certain Soleil guy? Yeah. That his stuff? Yeah. Um, for that stuff, and he was an Act Lab guy? Yeah. Yeah, projects mapping on trampolines for certain Soleil's. So yeah, so it's just really interesting to kind of start to see that people have really made it. And at the time, it was just this kind of random thing. So, you know, when I have people just making stuff and taking risks and being awesome, like there's a whole generation of people that have already done that. We have people that have become millionaires. We have people that are stars. We have people that are doing what y'all say y'all want to go and do. And that's why I encourage y'all so much to just keep doing it because that is how you And that's one of the thoughts that that's really punch on. But Jason is all about the music and visuals. And what's cool about Jason is that he is our original like conversion media 
lecture series <laughs> lecturer. Okay. He has been here. No, I'm Joel's all right. That's right. He has he has probably lectured six times. Yeah. Around six times. Yeah. Since um, been done, yeah. Like since I started here, like in the fall of when I started here, he gave a talk before anybody else came and gave a talk. At that time, he just had one of these. And, uh, and he was like, we got this thing, it's called the APC forum. And now, as you can see, he has all this other stuff he's going to show us. But I will uh, stop talking now and uh, give us a talk. But he, had, he introduced us to EDM. He showed us all what we needed to use. We took those tools, by the way, and we took it over to San Antonio City. Like, we played single, uh, just to report back, we, we played every single club in San Antonio as Converging Media. We, uh, last fall, as you all know, through a 200-person EDM event here on campus with me. Yes. Okay. And we had projection. So yeah, I know some of you are laughing. I'm like, I don't know. When I explain that to the faculty, they're always just gonna be like, so what you did what? I'm like, well, I mean, it's a campus. I like, you know, we want it, and we did it under the premise of promoting school spirit. And uh, when I was talking to the administrators, they were kind of like, well. Okay, and I'm like, well, you we have to remember, um, we were bragging about this at the Institute of Texas and Cultures when we were meeting with them last week. And uh, I was like, you have to remember that we were going from D2 to D1, okay, meaning like Division 2 to Division 1. And one of the things about our campus that needs to change is that we can't be a commuter campus anymore if we're going to be D1. If we're going to be D1, like, you really do have to have fans show up to the game. You really do have to start building school spirit. People really do have to want to be on campus and have to be excited about the brand of their school and like proud to be a part of which sounds really cheesy right now because like we're not. <laughs> well, we are. You know, everybody else starts laughing. But that's you know, and that's where like, you know, I'm proud to go to UT, I'm proud to go to UNAM, I'm proud to go to Texas State. Okay. Yeah, that's right. I thought no about Texas State. I said that. I'm just kidding. But my point is is that we're having a good time. Jason's gonna die. Yeah, we were totally throw down here in San Antonio off of what you taught us. And uh, we are excited to see what you're going to teach us so we can throw down an email in San Antonio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so like I said, um, my name is Jason Torres. And I'm going to get started. It's fun. Thanks, Apple. Fair enough. <laughs> um, so while that does its thing, um, just to piggyback on that, I mean, the App Lab, that kind of, I mean, what's up here is basically the successor to such. I mean for me it was it was that it was what built that school spirit for me. It was the quintessential college experience. I know I talk about it. I mean just staying up, helping my friends out, working until four AM on a school night, um, getting getting stuff done. Um, I'd never felt that bonding before, but that's when I showed it to me and it just paid off because um, the projection mapping stuff that I now do, everything I've done now is uh, stuff that started in Act Lab. Um, a friend of mine I worked with Elijah Parker. He was uh, in the class we were in, and he and I started experimenting with that. And uh, um, so a little bit what I'm going to talk about today, while this is trying to do its thing, is interface. Um, it's especially important in what I do, just because. I've got to manipulate, uh, visual-wise, I've got to manipulate, I mean, video files. So how do you, how do you, you can't touch video file. You can just kind of film and roll it back and forth in front of a projector. So how do you do that? I mean, you've got all different ways. You've got iPads. I've got a little bit of everything um, going on here. And... So uh, basically just talking about how that's going to, and, and well, how it definitely is important for live performance, what I do, but really just um, for any kind of performance. Um, really just talking about how interface, I mean, you can only do with, with what's possible with that interface. And that's both a good and a bad thing. Um, so this is, um, no, actually, this one, let me draw this. So.
So creativity and custom. Uh, how it affects digital performance. What you see here is an old drum machine sequencer. So it's like from early 80s, and that's only to sync or only to create electronic drum. So now I can do that on my phone a million times over. It used to take a whole crazy box, all kinds of inputs and outputs on the back, I mean, just to do what our phones do a million times over today. So just think about that when you think about how far we've come. Um, what about me? Uh, graduated from UT in Austin, like I said before. Um, I majored in step ladder posing. <laughs> I did the Disney Club, like we were talking about with Joey. Um, my background is mainly, I got started with all of this as an audio engineer. Um, been doing that for about eight years now. Um, so I started at Ableton around that time maybe six or seven years ago, um, and I've been using that exclusively to produce, uh, remix, record, master, mix, anything audio-wise, it's the best for me. Um, started DJing about 2008, so it's been about five years now, um, and I used Ableton for that, which um, there's a, a little bit of a stigma around, but I'm going to see why that's done a little bit. And as far as the visualist, I can say that I'm actually been doing that two years now, which is ridiculous. When you get to see it all I've done. Um, so as far as audio engineering, um, I've done some local blacks, Good Town, they're getting pretty big. Uh, Master some of the Gravitas stuff. Um, my good friend Sheila, he and I did a bunch of stuff early on. Um, DJing stuff, I've opened up for Borgor, Brazen, Breda, um, Bronze Whale, Gravitas artist. And then I also had a blizzard part outside for the first time last year, so I was really excited, but that's always a lot of fun. It's like a small-scale Burning Man thing out in Oregon, uh, Texas. Um, now, on the VJ side of things, I guess that's what I'm most known for. Um, last year, I got flown out to El Paso for their Neon Desert Music Festival. It's basically their ATL. Um, and I was contracted to do the visual performance for Moby. Um, it was their headliner, so that was really cool. Because that was uh, that was the first, that was the first time I've been flown out for a period. It's the only time still. Um, <laughs> that was I mean that was that was the rock star stuff. Yeah, it hard got to go out, um, make some awesome stuff happen, and yeah, so that was really cool. This year I had the pleasure of working Southwide. Um, I got to work AM Lonely Showcase, which is a huge booking company here in America. Um, also, I got to work the Road to, Ult uh, Road to Ultra show. And Ultra is like the giant rave they have down in Miami for WMC, it's a winter music conference. It's like the South by of uh, electronic dance music. It's in Miami every year. And then I also got to do, uh, what else did we do? The Nottish Room show. They're the guys that invented the Mutone. Um, so that was really cool too. Um, but during that week, um, five shows in six days. Um, along with day job every day. Uh, I got to do Bauer. Um, I don't want to shave or don't have the internet or anything. Cruella, <laughs> uh, uh, Disclosure is like huge in the UK right now. Not as from, like I said, Cast, a big homie of ours, 12th Planet. Um, he's the producer who did all the Jay-Z stuff. Um, Will Payne Gardner is out of Austin, actually. Alvin Risk, Rental. Um, Alicia, another Gravitas artist, Sandra Van Dorn, huge trans guy. Um, so, yeah, I've gotten to do a lot, and it's been really exciting. So, the way that I thought of that is with the interface. I mean, it's all, everything boils down to interface. It's not, like I said, not just exactly what I do, but in every way, shape, or form. Um, let's just look at the definition, actually. A couple of them. So, and these are going to get very kind of cut and dry, very physical, but I mean, a surface regarded as a concrete two spaces, so it's I mean, an actual point at which my body connects with the iPad, um, the touch screen, in this case. Um, common boundary or interconnection between systems, concepts of human beings. That's where it starts to get a little more heady, and it's like, okay, this is the actual space at which I'm conveying what I want to do, and I am telling the iPad what I want to do. So, um, it's also just simply a communication interaction. So I mean, every time I touch it, every 
different way. Every thing that I do is, I mean, I'm basically again communicating an idea, um, thing or circumstance that enables separate and sometimes incompatible elements to coordinate effectively. Um, so again, I mean, talking about this is the actual object, the touch screen, the button, the figure. That's what uh, the actual thing itself that allows me to communicate that. So why is it a big deal? So a set of controls, especially in my world, controls your performance. I can only do what the buttons I have or the knobs, faders, whatever, whatever the interface can do. I can't do anything more than that. Um, but the physical layout of the device makes certain things possible and makes other things very easy. Um, we'll take Cuneo, for example. This is made, um, it's made out of Austin. No. No? Oh, okay. Uh, well, anyway, Cuneo, it's got some drum pads on it. It makes uh, tapping in drums very easily. Um, it's got fader kind of stuff, so I can, I can do fader stuff, but not necessarily as easy maybe as just using an actual physical fader. So um, it lends itself to some things, while many other things are impossible. Um, live digital form performance as a whole is really just how much do you want to have on your plate? I mean, I'm sure you've all heard or seen or thought that, oh, DJ is cool, man. Stand up there. Damn. Shake hands for a second, and then they just kind of jam <laughs> around or they're jumping the audience on a floaty and hit people in the face with cake. Um, <laughs> Yeah, like, cool, it can be that easy if you want it to be. That's, that's awesome. We can step that up. Get us up. Um, or, I mean, do you, do you want to worry about beat matching? Do you, or do you want to go all the way? Do you want to be actively creating live generative visuals? Do you want everything that you do to have an impact? And if, you, if you're not actively doing something, then it's going to show. So it can be as complicated, it can be as simple as you want it to be. And I think the biggest part is finding that right balance. So the different applications that I'm talking about here, like I said, I wasn't just talking about what I do in particular. I mean, the guitar itself. Um, think about we have about 100 years of music that has come solely from the guitar. Think about how many genres are based around the guitar. Okay, you, Obviously, you're going to start with like rhythm and blues. Um, you're going to go into country. You're going to go into uh, get some bluegrass kind of stuff. Obviously, rock and roll. Um, then you're going to start moving into funk. You're going to start moving into um, punk, uh, metal. Uh, I mean, then whatever, wherever we're at now. Okay, so that's what nine that I got through, just running through. So think about that. People have been figuring out how to mess around with the guitar for a hundred years, and they're still not done. It's obviously still one of the main ways that music is made, and that people communicate and work through an interface to transmit sound and put a feeling in your ear. Spaces, things. Um, drums, that kind of stuff for sure. Um, uh, I mean, how they're laid out, uh, what drums you have in front of you, obviously makes some things very possible. Um, oh, yeah, that's not wrong. Uh, video lighting consoles. Um, I mean, lighting consoles, like I said before, I mean, you can only do, you only have 10 fingers. Um, so you can only really do what those 10 fingers can manipulate or. Um, they happen at any one time. Um, even I mean, computer interfaces, and we've all we've seen the transition in the past 10 years to things like touch screen um, that we carry around with us in our pockets to where a computer interface back in the day was an actual interface. It was an actual computer whose sole job it was to interface with the actual real computer, um, terminal kind of mainframe kind of stuff. Um, Cameras as a whole, too. I mean, um, cameras only going to be able to do so many things. Um, video game controllers, big deal, big money these days. Um, obviously, you, you're either an Xbox person, you're a PS3 person. If you're a Wii person, we're, I guess they're not even talking to you. Um, but people, I mean, people are, are I mean, it's, it's like they're very brand loyal when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, so, like I said before, interface, it, it limits us to a degree, but when we push those limits, it makes <coughs> it really cool. Um, Tom Morello, Rage Against the Machine, I don't know, I mean, if you've never heard it, just go and listen to it right after this, Rage Against the Machine rules. Um, but he was one of the most unconventional guitar players for a while just because 
he was not really focused on, well, here's the awesome chords I'm going to play that are so catchy for the verse, they're going to hook everybody in. No, he was more into using his guitar as basically a synthesizer. He would mangle it with all kinds of effects. It was much more of a sonic, rhythmic performance as opposed to a very melodic um, usage of such. And he would also use it in a very melodic, awesome way, but being back and forth, going to build attention with some weird effects and then drop in traditional um, kind of power chords like everybody's used to, he does it right. Um, turntable scratching. Obviously, uh, it was never meant to do that, and then some dudes were like, whoa, that sounds really cool. Um, and they kept doing that, and it sounded, and obviously we have entire genres of music that have come off. Um, I mean, you think about it, it's like, and it's like fast forwarding a table almost. Like, can you imagine whole genres of music starting off something like that? A, a CD skipping. Um, these were not intended by any means. That's, that's, that's a bit, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's what my mom says. Um, <laughs> auto tune. Auto tune was, was, I mean, you think about it, it was, it was made to fix, it was made to make pop stars really easy, even easier than they had been doing it. Um, and then, it wasn't, Daft Punk wasn't the first, but I mean, they really popularized, okay, let's, Take this to the extreme when you can look. I mean, because people were manually vocal tracks for years before that. Um, but when you can think about, okay, cool, I can basically play this vocal line like a synth. I can make it be, I can change its melody completely, and I can, and it has this kind of cool sounding effect. Um, so again, I mean, just. You have, the, you have the interface, you have the ability to move these notes around and move them where they should be, like it's normally supposed to be used for with auto-tune, or you have the interface to make it go crazy. Um, so, a little overview of just all the different types of things that can be used, that I do use to um, make this stuff happen. Um, so, just a little bit of history on the interface. Um, Xerox, the copier people, actually ended up the first GUI way back um, late 70s. Um, and Apple had the foresight to be like, yeah, we want that. And so this is why, I don't know if anybody's ever used a really old Mac, but the, the Xerox interface um, is basically the building block for the first Mac uh, graphical user interfaces for those who don't know what it is. Um, so, going from there, um, we'll start with kind of touchscreen stuff. So, one of the really big controllers um, early on, because uh, 10 years ago, there weren't many controllers at all. It's been really an explosion in the past couple of years. Um, one of the big ones, though, was a company called Lemur. Um, it's actually the third and current version of my iPad. They built the first kind of touch screen. I was going to say, and they were also really expensive. They were in They were like a thousand dollars. Yeah. They were like a grand. And this is like 2000 grand. Or 2000 era of grand. So it was yeah. ridiculous. Um, but it allowed this level of customization um, that was really unprecedented before. Um, there was nobody that had, I mean, a large, touchable real estate screen that you could completely customized at will. You can see here he's got um, some faders set up. He's got like a, either a weird envelope roller or something, little buttons, um, little little rotary things going on here. And you can have as many of those as you want, have as few of them as you want. Um, so it really kind of changed the game. Daft Punk was famous for using um, on their, um, their last tour. Uh, so yeah, there wasn't a whole lot out there. Um, now, um, coming with the time, so recording with the iPad, still around. This is what I use personally. Um, there's not everything I need at this point, but uh, I just use Touch OSC. Um, very similar, you build your own um, kind of graphical interface. This is actually one of the ones that I use um, to DJ with. And it's uh, the same basic concept. You just have your little building blocks. These are all little touchable effects I can use. Um, I've got like a master fader. I can adjust the playhead of the video, change colors, uh, double or half the speed, forward, backwards, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, I, and I've kind of, I mean, I've definitely been an evolving 
uh, setup just because it's it, I'm not locked into anything. As I play with the software more, I can say, okay, cool. I don't really use this a whole lot. This is really effective. This needs to be a little more sensitive. This could be a little bit bigger, and I can do all that. I don't have to go out and buy a whole new product. Um, I just have to spend a little time. Um, this this app is really cool. These dudes are really new. Beat surfing. Um, a very very similar concept. You basically got your little um, your little pads, faders, all the same uh, building blocks. But they are kind of promoting what's called beat surfing. And where they're basically kind of, it's, it's much more for um, specific audio performance. So this is, these would basically be a song, what you're seeing here, one song, and a series of movements. So this guy goes, like slides his finger up here, this is going to be, like, that's like a drum line or something. So it's a very um, intuitive, uh, live, jamming, uh, musical Experience. I recommend it. It's a cool video to watch. Um, so I think some of that stuff is, would, would be, I mean, is, is going to be a lot more popular. The only thing with that is it's, it's extremely time intensive to get something like that set up. I mean, every little, every little spot here, you've of course got to assign that sound, but then you've also got to map that sound. And then what's going to happen when you go to this? What happens when you press both of them at the same time? Does something different happen? And it's, it's a lot of work, which is why I haven't jumped in there yet. Um, this was another one of the really early uh, controllers, and it was uh, we're moving into the kind of tactile area at this point. We're kind of moving away from touchscreens. The mono um, was basically kind of set the design for you know, what you see here, the APC 40, the kind of grid of buttons, um, and that's all it was. It, it was it wasn't programmed to do anything. You had to program at all, um, so it, there was definitely a learning curve initially. But when it came out, there was nothing like it. So it was uh, quickly adopted by the experimental musicalists and things like that. And you can see APC 40 is what you see over there, um, building off the same design. It's made specifically to work with Ableton, um, which a lot of people like. Um, uh, let's see what else. One of the I mean, earliest ways and one of the ways people found was to just treat the synthesizer sounds, I mean, like a normal keyboard. So I went ahead and threw in one of those. So you don't really need the old synths or anything like that. Um, for conveying melodic note information, it's still just one of the most convenient ways to go about it. Um, you can see they're also, though, I mean, kind of tailoring themselves to, I mean, artists who do what I do. You've got knobs, you've got compads there. So it's kind of like your all-in-one little production unit. Um, kind of a similar unit. It's great. I definitely recommend one. Um, Leap Motion. Did y'all get one of these? Your, that's the new one that just came out, right? Yeah, it's like yeah, yeah, out yeah, yeah. next yeah. month. Yes. Awesome. You're so right. speaking of videos to go and watch, Leap Motion. Okay, so it's like this is the this is the unit right here. It's like. Where's the last one? Right. Um, did yeah. they? Yeah. Nice. I because I know they. I mean, people yeah. got them. Or about all the orders for them, yeah. That's awesome. So it's excellent. And basically, to emulate how it works, so say I'm typing on my computer right here, I have the leap right here, it's kind of where my keyboard is. It turns a two, basically an eight, eight foot cube, so a two by two by two area, into the most, uh, the highest resolution kind of, I don't even know what it used to be for it. Anyway. Basically, you can draw in the air, and it is the most precise thing you've ever seen. Like you can just you can draw with like a pen, and it will get every little nuance. Um, but this is really cool because obviously I can use it with this. I can set if I move my pen up and down, like a theremin. Um, I can for visual stuff. I can have the brightness go up and down. I can have it change colors. Um, I mean. I could like slap through it, and it would be like water slapping like through a wave or something. There's all, all kinds of stuff that's going to be opened up by this stuff. Um, going back to more tactile stuff, this is uh, actually made by a company out of Austin, um, Limited Instruments, and it's what's called a bass controller. Um, you've got another grid of buttons. These are a little more like drum pads as opposed to just buttons, so it's encouraged people to kind of jam on them. Uh, the reason I have it, I include it is because it's got some touch faders, and that's something that's fairly popular, but it's kind of weird. It's kind of bridges that tactile 
touch screen thing. They have LEDs so you can kind of see information. Um, they're not my favorite. I used to have a controller that had them. Not my favorite. Um, going back to the loop, or the leap, um, you've got the connect, which can also be used. Obviously, it has uh, all the sensors and cameras um, for it will track your body movements, and you can feed those into the software and do whatever. So when you raise your hand up, it creates a new color or a new plays a video. Move it down, it stops it. Um, so really interesting stuff you can do there. Um, lots of cool stuff with people like controlling their visuals as they're projected on them. Um, yeah, super cool stuff. Nintendo Wii controllers, buy some of those if you haven't, because those have multiple fun things you can do with them. They have the Bluetooth stuff, so um, they will receive, I mean, X, Y, yaw, data, all that kind of stuff. So, um, but another thing they also have is they also have infrared um, shooting out of the top, and you can use that to actually uh, do kind of similar stuff to connect and leap, like you can use it to um, basically kind of track your movements, and stuff like that, very similar to how Connect works. Um, but they're like 50 bucks. Yeah, so all the software is free online. Um, so a lot of the way a lot of this stuff works, it basically there's a couple of types of data that's used as far as in digital interface stuff. Um, MIDI is, is probably the oldest. Um, it was made in the 80s, musical instrument digital interface. Yeah. Um, and it's basically just a coding language that's. You see any other I'm not surprised. <laughs> really? Um, that's our professor from my She helped develop me. Uh, that's my mind. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, MIDI's been around, like I said, since the 80s. Um, it was, I mean, basically the explosion in synthesizers is, is kind of really related to MIDI in the 80s. Um, OSC. It has been coming out in the past, it's more popular in the past couple years. This is basically the updated version. It's about a thousand times higher depth as far as the um, amount of information it can receive. The control voltage is actually the oldest. It was what regular old school synthesizers used before things went digital. And it's basically just the raw voltage itself, excuse me, being pumped out of whatever is coming out of. So if you're, if you're, um, I don't too techy here, but okay, so say you have a synth sound and it's playing a static sound, okay, it's just going straight, it's just a ding. So you can introduce what's called modulation to that, to where basically it's going to sound like it's going up and down. Bam, bam, bam. Okay, so control voltage is that actual uh, wave that is making it uh, go up and down, so it's actual electricity. Um, finally, DMX is. Uh, is basically what's used to control lighting. Uh, probably around the same time, 80s, 70s, late 70s. Um, it uh, runs through actually XLR cables a lot of times, which is microphone cables, so it's kind of cool. Uh, but yeah, mainly just to control lights, and it's again its own little programming language. Um, and I think that's a picture of some old mini sequencer from some old computer. Um, one really big thing. Um, like I said, as far as the debating kind of stuff goes, open and closed systems. Um, the mono, one of the ones I showed you a while back, was really big because it was it was totally open. All its software, everything for it, was, uh, the software itself was free, and everybody would share all of their patches, everything that they created with the, the community, so everybody could build upon what everybody else had done and make it even better. Um, so. That's a huge aspect in this kind of stuff, just because everybody is, I mean, creating the whole point is customization. APC40 is an example of a closed system. Um, it's the reason that I will not say it's my favorite, because with the CUNEO, for, for example, I can tell it to make this pad send um, MIDI note uh, A4. So it's um, in the fourth octave, the A note, okay? So I can sign this one to be B4, C4, D4, or I can sign it to be whatever I want. APC40, I cannot change the way they're assigned. If this is A1 right now, I can't change that. And it sounds just like, okay, well, cool, I can, I can kind of get around that in ways, but 
Um, it really limits on what you're able to do when it's more than capable of doing such. They just basically don't have software where you can go and edit that. That's a huge deal, and that's, yeah, like I said, I can't do a lot of the things that I want to do with that because of such. Um, and again, tangibility versus touchscreen. Touchscreen is awesome for some things. Tapping buttons, um, having those kind of customizable controls that I can update whenever necessary. Um, but I found during South by that running your finger up and down as a fader kind of jumping up and down is way harder than just going like with this little guy. Um, you have to make the sound it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> It's way easier. So turning a knob for certain things or having just a tangible button that I can jump to at any time is, is a lot more convenient um, than having to maybe go through different pages. Um, having something that's dedicated for it, it's right there, it's tangible, I know it's always going to be there. Um, and then you start to get into like muscle memory kind of stuff too. If I'm, if I'm going to play with this setup all the time, then I know that like, at some point I will know without looking that by being right here, I'm on this last knob, and I know exactly what it's going to do um, in my, just by thinking, okay, I want to have this effect happen, my hand instantly goes for it. And so with the tangible items, that's obviously very possible. When you're working with the constantly fluctuating kind of touchscreen interface, not as easy. So it's, uh, they both have benefits, they both have downsides. Um, so I'm going to do a couple of demos just to kind of show uh, how all this works, and just kind of give you an idea of you know, how interface works. Um, I'll also kind of pass around the iPad, and uh, just so you see what it does. Cause, yeah, you won't hurt it or kill anything. Um, so, So this is, I'm going to do the BJ stuff first. Um, let's see. So this is the program that I use. It's called Resident Avenue. It's uh, made for playing videos in a really crazy manner. Um, but yeah, basically I'm just going to kind of give a brief demo of uh, all this goes down here. Turn the lights down a little bit for this. Is that going to mess everything up? Mm -hmm. Cool. So we're going to do it anyway. Audience here? And the front, so if you can get the front. Just the one. Probably good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. yeah. It's perfect. It's <laughs> <laughs> all in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> like, the dub I do is really minimal, okay? Really minimal. Well, you just look really hard. It's yeah. happening hard. <laughs> 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 Thank <laughs> you. 
to do this when I was a kid, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that these visuals, what file formats do you use now? Um, so these are just uh, these are just QuickTime movies, .mov files. Um, this particular program has uh, a certain codec, the DXV codec, that it really likes. And um, it apparently helps it, uh, I think it offloads a lot of the processing to the GPU. So it lets you just do a lot of this stuff without kind of insane draw on your computer itself. Don't you control the auto? I've got all. I've got. I've got the same stuff over there. It's over there. So. So um, so how do you put a set together? Like, how do you decide your visuals? Do you work with the artists or? Depends. Yeah, if they're if they're down and they want pictures. <laughs> Yeah, I'm down to do that. Um, usually, I just break it up into kind of themes. A lot of these packs have very similar, um, just kind of color themes and formats. So I've got like lots of kind of more minimal <laughs> stuff, black and white stuff that I can go crazy with color with. Or I've got lots of just like really kind of complex, organic kind of triangle stuff like we're looking at now. Um, that was cool that you used simple shapes. Yeah, well, in, in a lot of what I found, especially like working, like I was doing, we were, I was on an LED wall, um, so that it doesn't have nearly as much detail as something like a, an HDTV is going to have. So it's finding like really simple shapes, um, lots of contrast with the color and stuff like that. Like, it works really well. 
Um, and then even um, a lot of what we've been doing is just kind of messing around more with the effects. So taking really simple content and going nuts on the effects. Like that is happening there. Um, <laughs> just and that's like this is half the fun for me because like half the stuff. Um, I mean, I've been I'm in my own world with all of it. Like getting with Jesse and Kendall this time, having them work uh, do visuals as well, having getting feedback on what I was doing was like cool. Okay, I've been in my little zone. That makes sense. I'm definitely gonna try that. So we incorporated a lot of new stuff for that, um, and then even just playing with it. I I know to go do certain things, but they'll um, kind of think, well, I'm gonna try like this, and you get awesome. Yeah. Um, do you practice and time yourself on which beat you're gonna use for that particular period of time? Do you just go not really. Um, not with this stuff. Uh, just because. Um, it's luckily much more forgiving than uh, than audio, so I can I can mess up on this. I can hit something at the wrong time. I can quickly bring a fader down, and it's like cool, no big deal. It's not like messing up on a CDJ or a record. And so that's kind of cool. Um, but it also, like, I'm really just kind of feeling the crowd, feeling um, like where the music's at. What I do at the house may be totally different than what feels like I should do in a live situation. Um, so as far as um, I haven't really gotten, you can kind of basically sequence with Avenue. So I could have music set up that basically directly controls all the videos. And um, so that's something as soon as we find more time that I'll mess okay. with. But again, another extremely time consuming um, endeavor there. But something like you, let's say you had a play, like we've seen projection mapping used in like, uh, theater performances, and you could theoretically set cue points and make this program play a certain video at a, at a point where mm -hmm. someone was triggering the music and the video would start right at the same point. You could synchronize your show and do it. This is much more like, we call it DJing because it's like DJing. And what Jason and I think is saying is, he kind of rides along with the DJ and the crowd and, and kind of creates the experience on the fly, which is fun because when it really hits and it works and it feels good, like there's a couple parts in your performing where it's like, yeah, like it all work together. And that's cool. It's, it's, it's the same reason why we like to watch people play guitar because you might mess up. You know? that's mm -hmm. so the possibility is there to mess up, but the possibility for awesome is also there. Have you, um, so is there any vector stuff that people do or not really? Um, I don't know. I was just wondering. I don't know how it would work inside of a. That's why I was like inside of it. Um, I know that like a, like there's a lot of live like Quartz Composer is how a lot of the Apple graphics are made. And you can drop just straight Quartz Composer files in here, so you can do live generative graphics. Um, you can also just drop straight Flash. So, yeah, so you can't um, do that too. I mean, yeah, okay, I guess in that point. I guess the flash I've seen is mainly text based. So like you can um, plan on getting some to where I can just kind of type in the artist names on the fly and I've got an awesome little moving. Um, Have you messed something. with uh, you know, like your visual environments? Like one of the things that uh, now that we've done enough projection mapping to like have our feet wet, we want to do like multi uh, projector mapping where like not just like a, like wider but like to have yeah. You know, on sprints and yeah. that kind of stuff. Have you done that? Or? No. Um, I mean, we've definitely looked into it for things before. The, the big thing that you run into is that you've got to get basically one of those uh, matrix devices. Yeah. Or, We're going to get one of the triple heads. Yeah, the triple head. <laughs> yes. Um, we've got one on order. Nice. Hey, let me know because I, I want to mess with it and see. Dude. You basically. Yeah, this thing's awesome. I'm looking at it. It's crazy. Yeah. You basically, I mean, did a device like you have three outputs, three HDMI's or whatever, so you've got three screens side by side, and all different, all different projectors, and yeah, that's that's how they do the really really big shit. Um, so, so yeah, I always do that at least once when we just talk. Yeah, mission friendly, Jason. Come on. I know. I know. Hey, y'all are the ones serving. Yeah, <laughs> hey, it's mission friendly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, we treat wine in our services. So. Um, what else? Uh, I guess that. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. Um, is uh, you, I guess the live generator of graphics uh -huh. um, that involves sort of controlling the visuals via the, the music live, right? Or yeah. So that, right? kind of so, stuff, that stuff was really cool because what you can do in Avenue 
is um, you can basically kind of generate parameters for that stuff. So um, I can have like, uh, what does it have? So it has like line generators. So I can control the number of lines with a fader. Um, or I can control the brightness or the width or any of that, the rotation. All of that with controls. So I can, I can jam on creating live line stuff, like I was talking about live generating visual content. I can do that kind of on the fly. Um, you can automate everything in Avenue. You can automate it to the beat. So like a lot of these I have is kind of going every four bars to kind of cycle through whatever. So, and then I can obviously, I can tap in the tempo, um, which I'm doing like all the time. And so it's always constantly syncing up with uh, whoever I'm playing for in the world. Um, is, have you ever done anything with like LEDs and like Arduino or um, processing? Or anything? I, I, like I said, I was, I was on two different LED walls for, um, for South by this year. Um, I do want to get into just non-LED, uh, non-LED wall stuff with LEDs. I've seen some cool just kind of structures um, and those same little. Uh, That's what we're looking into as well. Like I was, um, I did that projection mapping for Luminaria. Right. And one of the things we wanted to do was have like a uh, fence with LEDs on them that we could control and have the like ambient feedback. Yeah. No, Mad Mapper, um, which is the projection mapping software that I use, they. Uh, have been kind of breaking into pixel mapping, and that kind of allows you to basically uh, play these videos, and it takes the content from those videos and translate that to the color of the LED light. So a very simple, just white bar going up can look like, um, depending on how you have the LED set up, can look like awesome. So yeah, that's that's something I really want to get into. Um, that just takes it into a whole new level. Um, yeah, so it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, so it made it all the way. It's still almost there. Cool. No worries. Did, did yeah. any question? So you said you worked with Moby. How did they how did he find you or how did this guys find you? That lady, um, so I was contacted by um, this this lady uh, who I guess worked with the Neon Desert people, the, the people putting on the show. Um, and she had done some work in, in, in projections before. Her, her, she came at it from much more of an art background. So it wasn't, uh, wasn't really what I did. It was kind of using projectors in uh, just different, different, not ways like this, not, not meant for electronic music shows. Um, so she found me on YouTube, um, saw some of the tests that I had done. Um, some of the gigs I had had up to that point, and uh, I guess it was a lot of the, the South by stuff, maybe um, that we did that year. Uh, and yeah, just reached out to me and said, "Hey, I'm doing this show." She said, "Hey, I'm emailed me and said, hey, I'm doing this show with Moby. Are you down?'" I was like, "Okay, sure, not expecting." You know, it, yeah. yeah, and it went all the way. Um, so as far as we didn't really have any kind of direct collaboration with him. She uh, designed a, a bunch of structures, kind of like some like satellite-looking things and some kind of weird angular kind of 3D polygon stuff. Um, and we had a huge screen behind it. We had a ridiculous projector. Um, it was a 20K projector. So like, if you looked into it, you would like melt. Um, it was. What's, it, a, what's a normal projector? Uh, Two, three thousand, so you're talking 20, you know, 10, 10 times more powerful. And it took a whole trailer, um, a gener like giant generator trailer to run it. It had a, a plug that you plugged in, it was like this big. Um, <laughs> like a, like a hundred grand, right? Oh, oh yeah, easily. Yeah. Easily. They had to put it on the, the promoter's entrance, like a million insurance, for yeah. sure. It's ridiculous. Um, that's why I like LED rolls as of late. So you don't have to worry about. Um, besides YouTube, um, mm -hmm. what other ways are you displaying your portfolio per oh. se so people can actually find out who you are? That's a good point. Um, so just walking around, um, I always have all of my portfolio stuff on my iPad. So that's always nice. Um, and it's very easy. I can, um, you can come on. Um, uh, so I always like to have that on there. Um, I did Vimeo. A little bit first, 
Vimeo's nice. It's a little more artist-centric. It's a little more stuff people have created. Uh, uh, Vimeo, Vimeo's like YouTube. It's a video hosting site. Um, but like I said, it, it leans more towards content that people have created, artists, and things like that, as opposed to YouTube, which is a you know, video of anything. Um, I don't like uploading my stuff in more than one spot. That's basically what it comes down to. I don't want to take all the time to do it. So it's all me doing it. I have a lot of videos. It's just too much stuff. Um, on the music side of things, I've used a lot of SoundCloud, um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Basically, I mean, anything to get people to know you when you have my website. Um, but yeah, YouTube. I mean, as far as this kind of stuff goes, I feel like it's the easiest way to reach people. Um, just because it's sent them a link. I mean, everybody's just like my attention spans are about like five seconds long these days, so uh -huh. it gets you there exactly. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so that's that's really cool. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, YouTube, YouTube, YouTube. Um, because the reason why I'm asking is because you know we're about to. Some of us are about to like grab you and stuff. Look at yeah. that portfolio of the stuff that we figure out the best way to do it. Definitely make a portfolio. Um, like yeah, we, we have a class. Oh, cool. Yeah, we have a class where we prepare everybody to graduate and then it gets a new portfolio. That's um, all I'm saying. When I went to y'all, it's a new portfolio. Yeah, yeah so we never really did that. They, they shut yeah. down Act Lab my last semester, so they took my dream semester. Stupid UT classes. Um, <laughs> um, not even joking. Like the audio class I had to take to graduate was. I didn't even go. It was so, so awful. Um. Anyway, yeah. Uh, just get a portfolio. Um, we put it on your phone. Put it on YouTube. Um, just get one and get one done. Cause that's, I learn all about it in my class okay. when you take it. Do you like that's what I have everybody like cross promoting the class here. You like yeah. how I did that? Um, and the people that are in my class now know it's legit because you totally got a job working for Mobile off of your YouTube channel. Which I told you. So, how many views do you have on your YouTube channel? I always it's, like it's so funny that the, the videos that I have a lot of views on, um, oh, one, is, one is a, well, one's an early video of me and Kendall uh, talking about our APC 40 setup. Yeah. It has like probably like 15,000 views at this point. I have a my first avenue, my first test of avenue when I did on like that little yeah. little uh, little statue from Mexico is like it has like three or four thousand, um, and like it's it's like so simple, but it's yeah. just like tagging tagging is huge. Tagging is what makes all made all of those hits happen. Um, it really helps. Like you know, you can you can hit niche markets with just like a few hits. And people will see what you've done. I had that happen a lot with the car research I would do at the people time. Oh really? Yeah, I'll find car Um so next what I'm gonna do is I'm like I said, I, I use Ableton to mainly made for audio production, live production, remixing it's really big on. Um, but it definitely can also be used to DJ. There's definitely uh, a lot of people that are uh, haters, we'll just use the technical term. Um, for people that don't like Ableton, because it's it's obviously I mean like if I'll show you, you press a button and it's cool. Ableton has its own little tempo that everything syncs at, so I never have to worry about beat matching. So which is which is awesome because this is how I learned about DJ. You can beat match now, basically DJ is no big deal. Um, but what Ableton allows me to do is to kind of I don't have to worry about that. I hope this doesn't mess up the mic too bad. Um, so. Um, I can worry about other things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you. I'm going to play four songs and almost all of them at the same time, uh, probably. So Ableton allows me to kind of start looping and kind of dropping stuff in and really letting letting me think about other things. Like I said, it's, it's what you want to worry about. Well, I don't want to worry about beat matching. I want to worry about, I mean, pulling a loop from this song and holding on to that, keeping that going, bringing it back in. Um, so. Here. You can see kind of what I've got going on here. Yay! We had it. We also have the APC40 that he's going to play with. We have that in our lap. 
Does Jason Tolles get one? <laughs> 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 like three years ago, we got one. We have one. Uh, like where I find it? Yeah, like Pandora. Um, Pandora is is a great one. Um. I will just throw on a station and make it like super complex where it's only playing stuff that I know I'm gonna like, and then I'll just go through and just listen to it for a while, bookmark all of them, and then I'll just, like a Saturday go through all that stuff, download all like the super awesome tracks. Um, I mean, I'm on Reddit all day, every day almost, so I always look out for free stuff on there. Um, a lot of the stuff we put out. Uh, yeah, the internet, just in general. Go to shows. Usually go to shows for music I already know about, so um, not so much that. So those cost money. Um, cool, so. So yeah, you'll be able to see uh, what I'm doing, what's going on here. You can zoom in. What's that? You can zoom in. Oh, no, I am zoomed in. It's going to mess up. Well, okay. yes, I don't need to see too much. I think if you reduce the resolution. No, it's just because it has over. It's over. If you reduce the resolution a little bit. Yeah, it'll be fine. Oh, it's no, it's, it's going to overrun any time. You're fine. Right, I'm gonna pull Jason's final project. Thank <laughs> you. 